I'm sure it says something about everybody that everybody automatically says at the very back of the, the room, but I'll not take it personally. Um, and I'm quite sure, given us a, an intimate crowd, if, if anybody has anything to shout out, I'll be able to hear them okay. Um, first of all, can I just invite or uh, welcome everyone to Parliament Buildings. Um, this is my last event that I am uh, speaking at as chairman of the, the Justice Committee. Um, I must have a really, really enjoyable 14 months uh, on that committee. And access, of ju access to justice is one of those big issues that keeps coming up time and time again. I think I'd say it's the fundamental component of a, a justice system that is fair and uh, one that works uh, and that is effective. And there has been an, an element of, of pressure on access to justice, even in my time as chairperson with the uh, restraints upon legal aid, with uh, cutbacks in, in spending of all government departments. And therefore there is a challenge in terms of maintaining access to justice and ensuring that those who are vulnerable in society are able to get uh, quality legal representation or support uh, on their justice journey. Um, but much is the same way as there are obviously challenges, there are also opportunities as well and I very much take the view that tighter budgets present an opportunity for us to think differently. It's an incentive for us to look to be innovative uh, and to look for, for uh, ways of doing things differently. Um, part of the help in that is also about technology because even Ten years ago, people were able to get support and advice in ways that was unimaginable uh, previously, and I think that is a, a massive step forward as well. Over the last 14 months, we've been running monthly innovation seminars um, and looking at some of those solutions to those challenges in, in austere times. Um, we have identified the, the pro bono work that goes on um, with the Bar Council, with the, the Legal Support Unit, and the, the, the Ulster University's Law Clinic. And I got to learn more about that when the committee visited Jordanstown last year and we, we, we spent some time with those who were delivering that service. Um, but I think there's also opportunities in future years to develop community justice centres or citizen hubs uh, that people can go along to to get legal advice or they can get uh, advice on their housing issues or general support uh, on a range of issues. Um, I think there's an opportunity there. And as I mentioned previously, technology is a, an area that I think will provide a lot of help uh, in terms of access to justice too. One of the areas that we identified and we looked at was the online dispute resolution system. I know David joined us in, in, in Holland for that. Um, and it's a system based on the eBay model that an individual can go on and take control of their own justice issues themselves, albeit in a supported environment. So there's legal advice there if the individual wants it or needs it. Uh, and there's judicial oversight at the end of that process. So the individual is very much taking on that personal responsibility, but when they need support and help, they're able to do it. And of course, that may become more important uh, moving forward if there's less money available for legal aid uh, and less opportunity for individuals to, to get the help of solicitor. But as long as that support and they're supported through that journey, that is one area that, that I think uh, could be developed in the years to come. And of course, in Holland, they use it. Uh, they use it in Canada, they use it in Holland. In Holland, they use it for divorce proceedings uh, as well. Uh, and I think there is an opportunity there to, to look at this uh, in a little bit more uh, detail. Uh, but of course, access to justice is also an important issue for uh, people uh, on a wide range of issues. Parents uh, will uh, have a, a particular issue, particularly those who are unhappy with the provision of special education needs to their children. And in January this year, the Assembly passed the Special Education Needs and Disability Bill, which is now waiting uh, for royal assent. And this bill is to give children who are over compulsory school aids, a number of new rights, including the right to appeal to special education needs and disability tribunal. It also provides for the Department of Education to conduct a pilot that enables children below compulsory school aids to bring forward an appeal. And this legislation raises a number of important issues that will need to be addressed over the next five years in the next uh, Assembly mandate. And they concern existing barriers to accessing justice in relation to special education needs, including perceptions of inequality and perceived lack of support for appellants the participation of children in the formal tribunal setting, uh, and determining the mental capacity of young people bringing forward appeals and provisions for those who are deemed to lack capacity in that regard. Uh, so to gain a better understanding of these issues, we have two presentations today. Uh, our first is by Dr. Gronje McKeever uh, from the Ulster University School of Law, uh, who will consider the role of the university law clinics in delivering access to justice right across the UK. And secondly, we have Dr. Orla Drummond, also from Ulster University, and she will be discussing access to justice barriers for tribunal users, focusing on special education needs tribunals in Northern Ireland and Wales, in light of Article 12 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, so again, welcome everyone to today's seminar. I'm delighted that everybody's here, uh, and I hope we'll have a, a good discussion uh, later on this afternoon. Thank you very much. 
Hi everyone, uh, Gronya McKeever, nice to meet you. I'm going to talk to you today about um, the role of university law clinics in delivering access to justice, which of course is a very specific issue, um, so fair play for turning up, but we're going to look at it in a broader context because it's not a standalone issue, it's not something that we can see as the ultimate solution to all problems, it's a, it's a part of a justice system that we have to understand. And so in order to understand the role of university law clinics in delivering access to justice, we have to understand a little bit about the advice-seeking behaviour of individuals in the UK. So the first thing that we need to understand is um, advice-seeking is connected to an individual's legal capability. So some individuals are very legally capable, others have very little uh, legal capability, and, and the range is quite extreme. Um, but we, we have some... Um, insight into the role that advice can play in delivering uh, support for people who lack legal capacity and in encouraging them to resolve problems at the earliest possible stage and to increase their legal capacity, not just for that uh, problem resolution, but for further resolutions as well. So we know that good quality support plays a critical role in developing legal capacity, but one of the, the main stumbling blocks for individuals is that they don't see their problems as legal. And indeed, it's fairly obvious that some of their problems are not always legal. Some of their problems are about housing, they're about social security, they're about health, employment, and they only become legal when it becomes a dispute that is attached to legal rights that has to be asserted. So at that point, when someone does realise that their problem has a legal solution, they can, also be, um, they can also face barriers at that point because when lots of people hear the idea of a legal solution, they think it's going to cost money, it's going to be um, financially prohibitive, and so they don't seek help uh, through legal means to resolve what they now understand can be uh, a legal problem. Um, so we've, we find that although um, justice departments uh, understandably put in lots of policies on prevention and the prevention of escalation of problems, lots of people don't take advantage of those uh, prevention me methods and instead they seek help at crisis point. And the crisis point for them is the earliest point at which they are ready and able to accept an intervention. So what looks from the outside like you've waited too long, in fact, for the individual, is the first point at which they've understood that this is a legal problem that they have to have a legal resolution to and that they now need help with. So that's the context in which advice is sought. Um, within, um, within the system that people seek advice, what I've called the advice ecosystem, we know that there are different paths to justice. We know that there are different types of advice provision. Uh, we know that there are different justice needs of individuals and that there are different methods of meeting those needs. And so what we see is an interconnecting system of legal advice provision. And as with any ecosystem, uh, the changes in balance will impact on other aspects. And we don't always understand or anticipate what the consequences of a change in that ecosystem balance will be. So we don't understand necessarily those unintended consequences of changing the advice provision in one part of the system, how that will have reverberations across the, the system as a whole. And so this project looks very specifically at one part of that system and, and that role within the ecosystem of uh, university law clinics. Within the ecosystem, therefore, we do need to understand the relationship. So it's not simply looking at university law clinics, it's looking at that clinic relationship with external providers. Um, our model of um, advice provision tends to be based around this idea of a competitive contractually based fund for legal services. Uh, and that can work well for lots of, of different projects and lots of different reasons, but there has been some research that's done in Britain looking specifically at voluntary sector advice. And our research, as I'll come to uh, presently, uh, shows a very clear relationship between independent advice agencies and law clinics, so I think it's important to understand the impact of um, changes to the voluntary advice sector through um, changes in that ecosystem. Um, two researchers, Summerlid and Saunderson, uh, have identified the impact of this funding model on uh, voluntary independent legal advice, uh, and particularly addressing two issues, the impact on service delivery and the impact on how they approach clients. So the impact on service delivery is not always positive. What we see uh, is voluntary sector agencies doing less complex work, doing less specialist work, um, doing much more high output work to meet funding targets and indeed withdrawing entirely from areas of law where funding is not provided. We also see this move towards activating clients, activating people, uh, activating people who often have very legal 
very limited legal capability, so we see things around self-help packages, we see things around information services and lots of signposting. Now, all of that can be useful if it's directed in the right way, but there are negative consequences as well. And one um, really clear impact that's been noted by the research is that there has been uh, a loss of capacity within the sector where we see organisations withdrawing from legal areas uh, because the funding is not there. Um, or because it's too difficult to meet funding outcomes. And we also see mission drift, where we see organisations concerned that they're chasing the funding rather than being true to the mission of the organisation. It's important to say we don't have equivalent research for Northern Ireland. So this research relates only to England and Wales, um, but that would be a very useful, I think, piece of research to be done because then we could start to see how university law clinics in the UK could interact with that advice system uh, in Northern Ireland. The development of UK university law clinics, um, they've been around since the 1970s. Um, they come from, uh, mainly from uh, an American and then later an Australian model, but we've seen a proliferation of these clinics in the UK from about 2010 onwards. Um, and they have multiple ambitions, sometimes competing. Uh, first of all is education, as you might expect from a university service, uh, that they will deliver high quality teaching and also uh, enable high quality research. There's a social justice mission that's, that's also quite clear, um, where universities are seen to be needing to be responsive to justice problems within the community. And then there's the employability agenda that all universities seem to sign up to now. Uh, this value-added student experience, you'll come to our university because you'll understand that the experience gives added value in terms of the legal skills that you'll acquire and therefore ultimately your, uh, your employability. And those are all valuable ambitions, but they do create tensions, particularly in relation to social justice uh, and core university objectives around teaching and research. Um, the map on, the, on your left-hand side shows the spread of university law clinics across the UK. Now, some of those dots will hide multiple clinics, particularly around the London area. Uh, so there's 64 that we've identified through this research, um, university law clinics that provide a public-facing service where free legal advice and or representation is offered to members of the public. Our research, um, the, the respondents to our research is on the map on the right-hand side. So there's a reasonable spread that we can see. There's only one in, in Northern Ireland, but that's because there only is one in Northern Ireland, none in the, in the Republic of Ireland. Um, so otherwise we get a, a reasonable spread of, of uh, information. Now what we don't have in that map, which would be very interesting, is overlaying that map with other advice service provision to see what that looks like. Um, it's not beyond the wit of man to do it, but it was unfortunately beyond the reach of this research to do it. But that would be a, an interesting and complex picture, I suspect. So what are, what are law clinics doing? Well, they're doing lots of different things. They tend to be um, very individual creatures, responsive to the needs of the individual law school <coughs> rather than directly responsive to the needs of the community. So they're bespoke creations. There's no typical model that the research revealed. There's lots of variation in terms of numbers of staff, of students, of administrators, of uh, external supervisors, of caseloads. So no consistency, really, across the piece. And that can be very beneficial from a university perspective because it allows the organisation to play to its strengths. The difficulty from a justice perspective is that there is no single off-the-shelf model that can be used to provide a stopgap for services or to supplement existing services. Lots of areas of law that are covered. Housing, uh, who knew, was the most popular. Um, but as you can see, you know, it ranges from human trafficking to education, immigration, consumer, commercial, and housing. And consumer and commercial took us by surprise because if there's a social justice mission, it wasn't necessarily something that we understood to be a social, an area of social justice. Um, and we think that there may be something around an employability agenda that works in through that. Um, but we can't be sure and we'd need to test that a little bit further. So on the face of it, it looks like law clinics can cover any area of law. But there are some limitations, obviously, around that um, opt optimistic conclusion. Um, the type of service that's offered uh, varies fairly widely as well. Um, 13 out of the 22 clinics who dealt with this question said that we only provide advice. And advice could often be limited to fairly basic advice, so it may not deal with the absolute specifics of your case. It might be quite basic, these are your legal options, but we're not going to advise you which is the best or which is the preferred option. Um, nine clinics said that they provided advice and representation, but representation could vary depending on how necessary it was felt to be. Certainly in Ulster University, we 
take cases up to a certain point and then we review and see if we have capacity to provide representation. So lots of clinics doing that as well. And that's all very well because it works for the university's educational model, but understandably it creates misperceptions among clients who are told that they're walking into a free legal advice service and so, not, under, not, uh, um, not surprisingly, they have these ideas that they will get immediate advice, which is not always the case. Students are often going back to supervisors to consult to make sure that the advice is accurate and up to date. Uh, they will expect to have full advice and representation. They don't understand the limitations in the model around capacity, so they may be disappointed there. They expect that this is a service and like services across the world, that they'll always be open, but uh, who knew that there were semesters in, in academic terms and who knew that universities aligned to those semesters? Why would individuals accessing free legal advice understand the idea of a an academic semester. So there are problems there. And interestingly, we find that one of the common misperceptions that was reported was that clients felt there would be a financial charge. So I'm not sure where that comes from, but um, we didn't manage to investigate that any further. So the question that that creates for us is, well, how useful are these services if they're creating all these misperceptions and if there are such limitations that are placed? Are they in fact part of the problem? Are they limiting the client's journey um, or fragmenting it in such a way that it's, that it's not helpful? I'll come back to that question as we go through. Looking at how cases were selected. Uh, this idea of social justice, this idea of unmet legal need was something that featured uh, for about 25% of our clinics um, who said, well, that's what our mission is. So we justify our case selection based on financial need. If people are assessed as in financial need and not able to pay for legal services, we'll take their cases. But if they're assessed as being able to pay for their services, we won't take their cases. Uh, and that was part of an access to justice agenda, but also, interestingly, not wanting to bite the hand that feeds them. So we don't want to compete with private law firms because we want those private law firms ultimately to employ our graduates. So a kind of a mixed bag of, of reasons there. 25% um, of clinics, however, said financial need is not relevant. What we're about is education, and so the financial need is not a, a criterion that we use. And generally, what we saw was that clinics looked at the complexity of the case, the expertise, the supervision, the capacity, the educational value, and any alternative support mechanisms that existed. But education was the driver. Education was the, the criterion that could override all other uh, criteria. Um, having said that, there was a, a, an awareness of people who needed to provide legal advice or could, could otherwise provide legal advice. Uh, and so we looked very closely at the connections to other external advice providers. And certainly there was very, very strong evidence from the survey that there was a really, a really good connection um, with other advice providers looking at um, collaborating on cases, looking at referring cases out or taking referrals in, uh, and signposting to other um, legal services. Um, it wasn't possible to conclude that the external collaborations advanced the client's journey particularly. That wasn't something that the, that the survey examined. But what we did uh, find that the clinics themselves identified independently the value that they saw being added to their service by the external collaboration. So from a clinic's perspective, the external collaboration provided additional support, additional expertise, uh, supervision, capacity, and so they were able to do more with the cases than they would otherwise be able to do. And they saw that for external providers, there were two types of uh, benefit that was being added. So for private firms, it was contributing to corporate social responsibility goals, and particularly through pro bono activities. And for voluntary sector advice services, uh, there was a sense that this was enabling voluntary sector organisations to increase their service provision and in some way, therefore, to alleviate the impact of funding pressures. Um, so we saw the kind of organisations that um, took onward referral, uh, and there's a range there. Understandably, perhaps, their greatest capacity was around uh, existing advice providers, uh, solicitors, independent advice agencies, barristers. But we see others that are picking up clinic services as well, job centres, social workers, housing associations, churches, financial institutions. So it's still kind of a good range of, of referral networks. And similarly, uh, on the way back out, where clients were, clinic clients were being referred back out, the same type of profile that was there, which is useful from an education perspective because although we see lots of referrals going to legal uh, services, we also see um, other, other solutions potentially being identified. So we see social workers, health workers, uh, job centres, employers, government departments. So it's not simply identifying a legal provider for a legal solution. 
In terms of how people got to the clinic, um, we saw that 84% of clinics took um, clients through referrals, so lots of um, evidence again of, of good connections externally. But we also saw public visibility coming through, 96% uh, of clinics taking clients on self-referral. Um, but what we didn't see was a different profile of advice seeker. We saw the same type of advice seeker that we see coming through other services. So people who come across advice by luck or by chance, not because they have sat down and really researched their problem and really researched the idea of who would be the best provider, but simply because they've Googled free legal advice and they've come across this, uh, this clinic uh, or somewhere else. So what we can say is that clinics are part of an access to justice ecosystem, but they are not the main focus for advice seekers, which is not particularly surprising. If you don't have much legal capacity, you don't conceptualize your problem as legal, you don't conceptualize a solution as legal, the first thing that you're going to Google is not going to be university law clinics. Um, so we know that clinics are there, but we know that they're not the most obvious port of call for people. Um, we also are very clear from the survey that those external connections are a necessary part of the lifeblood of clinics, that those clinics couldn't operate effectively without those external connections. Uh, and so we see a continued need to match the client to the right solution. It's not simply enough to have additional advice service providers. They have to be the right ones. Um, looking at intervention points to try and see how we could maximize the use of uh, clinics. Again, the same patterns that we see in other advice-seeking uh, behavior. Uh, individuals don't adopt consistent uh, approaches to dealing with their legal problems. They don't see this as a, a linear pathway. Um, so they seek help at a variety of stages and from a variety of sources. That's very useful for clinical law students. It's very useful to teach law students that this is the social security claim, for example, is not a claim which then becomes a dispute which goes through internal review, which goes to a tribunal, which goes to a commissioner because we know that social security is built in and around lots of other potential problems and so it's very useful for university law clinic students to see that. The difficulty, of course, that that creates is that there's no singular point at which uh, clients can routinely be referred to clinics for assistance uh, in a way that clinics can accommodate in line with their service provision. So there are limitations around that, but arguably that's a very narrow view of the problem because uh, I think we can uh, argue that access to justice is not the same as access to a legal solution and that simply having legal services there is not the only way to deal with what we conceptualize as legal problems. So one of the values that we saw from the research was that clinics are able to train law students to identify the best solution for the client rather than to prioritize the legal solution. So they could get back in touch with an employer or they could get back in touch with a local authority or they could uh, contact someone other than a legal service provider to develop a, a, a response that's more appropriate to the, to the client rather than progressing automatically to a tribunal or a court hearing. Um, and the other tip that we might be able to exploit is that if clinic uh, students or clinics indeed are seeing these kinds of problems that are coming into the clinic as legal problems, but they understand that there are alternative solutions rather than legal solutions, that we can start to identify those systematic or regulatory problems, which then gives us an opportunity to see what research needs to be done. Clinic objectives. Well, clinics want to do everything, don't they? They want to you know, make the world a better place. So we see lots and lots of objectives that clinics had, um, developing professional capacity, delivering access to justice, fostering a sense of social justice among students, uh, improving, improving client participation in the legal process. So, you know, they ticked all of the boxes. So then we had to ask them, well, prioritize what your objectives are. And they, they come down to these five uh, priorities, improving student employability, developing professional capacity in law students. So that still is the main agenda for university law clinics. And I think we do need to be alive to that. Developing access to justice is there, but it's not the priority. So that becomes then a question of the tension between legal education uh, and access to justice. So we ask clinics directly, do you think you should be an access to justice provider? And that was a clear division um, and lots of um, free text on those answers. 69% um, uh, 22 out of 32 clinics said the clinics should be access to justice providers, that that was an important function of a law school to develop that ethos of pro bono of access to justice through your community and through what you could do. A very important part of legal learning, a good pedagogic initiative, so met the educational objective and interestingly the moral obligation of law schools to provide access to justice and to use law students in that way. But, and lots and lots of caveats to that, uh, expressed as the idea that this should be a state function, it should not be a compulsory function on universities. 
uh, of those clinics that said clinics should not be an access to justice provider, they were equally adamant that that should not be the case, that education should be prioritised, that was the business of universities, that's what they should do, and so they should focus on that, but also recognising the limitations of the, of the model of clinics who were not equipped to cope with the volume, the time, and the resource intensity. Again, that emphasis on the state. The state's responsibility is to provide access to justice. It's not the university's responsibility. And then one identifying again, the hand that feeds us, we don't want to bite that. We can't conflict with the role of private uh, sector lawyers. Now, obviously, there's bias in our sample. We're only sampling those universities that have law clinics, so we don't have a comparable uh, evidence base from law schools without clinics. But 90% of the clinics, even when they were grappling with this idea of whether they should be access to justice providers, uh, saw themselves as access to justice providers by virtue of the fact that they provided advice and therefore access to justice for those who might not otherwise be able to access advice elsewhere. So the role of the universities has to be a part of this discussion. If we're looking at access to justice through university law clinics, we can't just look at the role of the state. We have to try and figure out where do universities fit within this profile. Um, and there are lots of objectives, of course, that universities serve, and sometimes clinics will uh, complement those objectives, but quite often they will compete with them. Uh, in teaching terms, the teaching mission is impacted uh, by student consumerism. We saw that coming through very clearly. Students now seeing themselves as paying fees and therefore paying for a service and consuming a service. So that has now changed the dynamic quite a bit, so that universities feel a need to respond to that consumerist demand. Clinical legal education is very resource intensive and so it may not meet the consumerist uh, objectives of universities. We know that the research around clinical legal education is not yet at a high enough level to be able to contribute effectively to the research objectives of the university through the research excellence framework. And so that objective is in tension with any resources that are expended elsewhere. It raises a much bigger question about how universities should serve and meet wider social justice objectives, understanding that they are not just monolithic creatures, they are creatures of their communities and within their communities, but needing some support, I think, to realise some of those objectives, particularly where they compete with core ambitions. And that, of course, then raises a question around the state's role and the state's connection to the university in meeting that obligation to ensure access to justice for individual citizens. So how do we do it? How do we deliver access to justice through universities? Well, the research is very clear. Universities are very much part, university law clinics are very much part of this intricate advice ecosystem uh, that operates in the UK, not simply in Northern Ireland. But we know that clinics aren't really going to be responsive or are very unlikely be, to be directly responsive to changes in the ecosystem. So they may contract, but they're not likely to expand in, in uh, response to um, other, changing fu other funding changes within the ecosystem that reduces availability of legal advice elsewhere. Just that means then, of course, that the impact on external organisations makes clinics a little bit more vulnerable, and any reduction in external capacity is likely to reduce the capacity of clinics to operate effectively, rather than to see it in the other way that we sort of wondered about, uh, would clinics be able to fill the gap that's left by funding um, deserts uh, or, or by any changes in that advice ecosystem? And the answer seems to be no that they work in such close proximity with external advice providers that where those advice providers externally are impacted, then clinics will be detrimentally impacted as well. There's lots of limitations on clinics. We can't pretend that they are this wonderful panacea without any limitations. There's limitations around the capacity, around their service model. They are student-centered. They are staff-driven. They're not client-focused in the same way that other organizations are. Um, they run the risk of increasing referral fatigue so that you have a limited service available within the clinic and so you're requiring the client to move on either to the clinic or from the clinic and that can be uh, a risk. There's no consistency in being able to refer uh, clients to clinics. There are external partner vul vulnerabilities as I've mentioned but they're also vulnerable to university strategic objectives internally and specifically in relation to uh, research. But Nonetheless, I think there is still a development potential there for clinics. Um, that healthy external advice environment is the main way that we can see to develop clinics. Um, it will enhance, if we can enhance external capacity for complex or specialist cases, then there's a potential role there to, to take the limited service model that clinics offer to provide basic advice, to start to do some of that more basic work and then hand it on to the experts. Um, so it's about supporting clinic relationships with external partners, 
but we, we can't just assume that that will be beneficial to the external partners. We've seen the clinic perspective on this. We need to see the external partner perspective. So we need to understand the value that external partners feel that clinics add. They may not agree that there is an expanded capacity issue um, or that they're adding significantly to their corporate social responsibility goals. And we also need to understand a bit more about whether clinics can enhance um, participation of, of individuals to be able to participate effectively in the legal system uh, and to enhance their legal uh, capacity. I think we can also harness the potential of clinics to draw lessons from frontline casework. That's where we should be really focusing. We should be able to use the clinics as these um, little laboratories to understand what the issues are that are arising in particular advice circumstances and then to go further and to understand those through, through uh, effective research. And I think that's something that we're, we're not really getting the most of from clinics at the moment. That does require um, important relationships to be developed with policy partners. It requires university support to engage in that type of behaviour. It also requires the capacity of external partners to be able to feed into that consultation, to be able to say, well, actually, yes, we're seeing the same problems, or these are the problems that we're seeing. We're going to hand that over to you, and we'd like you to do some research to understand that syst systematic issue. So that all points to a need, potentially, to support universities to align their core objectives around teaching and research to uh, access to justice. So we've made 10 recommendations in our research, identifying, of course, as you'd expect, further research that's needed, um, looking at the relationships with external partners, indicating the potential of clinics to research and develop innovative justice solutions. These should be the legal laboratories that we are looking at. This should be the place where you get to do some piloting, get to do some work, or get to do some research. Uh, and therefore supporting universities to be able to do that, to deliver access to justice, maybe as a byproduct as much as, uh, as an objective. Um, there's strong evidence from the research that clinics are part of the advice ecosystem and that their potential hasn't been reached. And so I think it's timely, given the consultation that the department is now going through on the Access to Justice Review, that we can consider the impact on the advice ecosystem that university law clinics now play. Thank you.